thanks everybody for coming. We tried to put stuff together to give you as much information as possible. It's hard in a half an hour to cover everything I want to cover. So I'll go through some things kind of quickly and focus a little bit more on others. I have a lot of handouts over there and I'll try to talk about what, what's available as I go through. So I just want to start with a little bit about bats. Most people know very little about bats, even as a, a wildlife major in undergrad. I had a tiny introduction to them and really knew nothing specific. And I'm not going to get into big details about it, but bats are mammals just like us, and they really are the only true flying mammal. There are other mammals that glide. There are over a thousand species worldwide, and they have a wide variety of different types of bats and, and different specialties in what they eat and how they fly and how they echolocate. We're going to focus on the bats in Georgia today. One of the really interesting things about bats, they're in the order Choroptera, and that actually means hand wing. And this is a great photo to show you how a bat's wing is just a modified human arm and hand. You can see that there's a thumb and four fingers, an elbow, a forearm, and everything's connected by skin. And the skin membranes are connected to each of those joints and bones so that that forms that full wing for the bat to be able to fly. So it's really cool when you have a bat in your hand and you can show people that it's just, you know, it's furry like we are and it has live young and it has basically the same parts, just modified. We have 16 species of bats in Georgia. A lot of people don't realize we have that many. Some of them are limited to certain parts of the state and we'll go over that. We ha I have posters available over there. If you guys want one, you can pick one up. All of our bats in Georgia eat exclusively insects. So that's what they're eating. And if people tell you they found a fruit bat, it's a crazy thing, they really did. <laughs> so we don't have fruit bats in Georgia, but they do a very good thing by eating insects. So I wanna quickly go over all the species and kind of where they are and, and what they look like briefly. I cannot give you species ID in this kind of talk, but what I did do is I brought a key to the bats in Georgia. That gives you a lot of characteristics of each species. I know a lot of times when people find bats, either rehabilitators or people that find them in attics, they're almost always a little brown bat. Well, almost all of our bats are little and brown, so that doesn't really help. <laughs> and that isn't really a bat's thing. I mean, it's a little brown bat. We have a big brown bat, but there's a big difference between them. I'll try to cover the difference between little brown and big brown a little bit to help you. But the main thing to tell between the significant the bats with a significant difference is the forearm measurement. So if you can get that, that can help you really narrow down what species it is. And then there's other descriptive features on the sheet. So grab one if you have any issues with bats and you're trying to figure out which one it is. These are gray bats. This is a, a bat that's an endangered species. It's only found in the northwestern part of the state. It's, we've got some new records north central, so it's definitely a North Georgia specific species. This is one of the cave bats. We kind of have bats grouped as cave or tree bats. And this species is unique in that it uses caves both in the winter time for hibernation and in the summer for maternity colonies to raise young. And they, they split into bachelor colonies. The males get kicked out and spend their summer in caves as well. But that's unusual. Most bats that spend their winters in caves don't spend summers in caves. Another species that does that is the southeastern myotis. This is a Georgia species of concern. It's in only the southern part of, of Georgia. And it is another myotis species that is, these are all very similar species. They're hard to tell apart. And these aren't, these two are not species that you would probably run into very often in people's <laughs> homes. The southeastern myotis will get into homes occasionally, but it isn't restricted to the southern part of the state. So you probably wouldn't see it unless you were in South Georgia. Another cave species is the Indiana bat. This bat is the beginning of the bats that hibernate in caves in the winter and then come out onto the landscape in the summer. These bats are endangered partially because they've been disturbed in caves for a long time, which is a major issue for bats. But also they have very specific requirements for their maternity roosts and, and their males also roost in the summer under the bark of trees. And the bark is coming off. They used to roost under emergent trees that came out of the canopy and died and the bark was falling off and they would jam up underneath. They want to be really hot and great, great sun exposure. Well, with, with timber harvesting and all the changes on the landscape, we don't have nearly as many large emergent trees dying in the canopy. So that's caused them not to have as much good summer habitat. And they'll also, you know, lose roosts during the summer. So they've had a lot of issues. Another species that uses caves in the winter and uh, is out on the landscape in the summer is the big brown bat. And this is probably the most common bat that people in this area have in their attic. And they usually get it 10 to 20 bats. These guys usually don't come in 
in huge numbers. We are getting a lot more free-tailed bats in houses now. We'll talk more about them later. But when someone has a small bat problem, it's usually big brown bats. These guys are not very big. They still have a, a relatively small body size. And again, you can look at the sheet and kind of get an idea of size. But they have pretty big teeth and they have glands on their nose. You can see that this is kind of swollen up on their muzzle. And their teeth are large because they specialize in eating beetles. So if you look at those teeth, I think this bat looks like a dog and it has really big teeth. And when you look at a little brown, they're much smaller, they're pretty tiny, they fit in your hand easily, and they are gonna be ferocious, just like the big brown bat, but their teeth are tiny. They'll still draw blood and they'll try to bite you, but you can tell the difference between those two just by looking at their mouth. They're significantly smaller and the forearm measurement will tell you right away whether it's a big brown or not because they have a very large forearm compared to the other small myota species. But it's a big difference between these two and they're commonly mistaken just because people get a brown bat in their hand and it's not big, so they think it must be a little brown bat. There are other cave bats that use caves in the winter and come out in the summertime. The tricolored bat is probably the most common bat we have on the landscape, widespread throughout Georgia. Um, you'll see this one in houses as well on occasion, but it's usually one bat or two bats. If you've ever been to the gold mines in Dahlonega, this is the bat that's there. They have a very pink forearm and they're the ones that get very frosty in the, in the wintertime when they're hibernating. We also have northern long-eared and small-footed myotis. The small-footed myotis is our smallest bat. It's about the size of your thumb. And those two you don't normally find in situations in houses. The Brazilian free tail bat is the only bat we have that has a tail that extends beyond the tail membrane. And it has crazy folds on its face and really unique ears. It's definitely different than any other bat we have. And you should be able to tell that one right away. If you see a tail and you can almost always see them, uh, you can tell which bat it is. And this bat is spreading further north. It's the same bat that's found in large numbers in, in places like Texas and Bracken Cave, but it doesn't really use caves in Georgia. It's more of a building occupying species. In, in Texas, they go to Mexico in the wintertime and come back to Texas. And here they're sort of year round in places that are warm enough. So they'll often switch roofs to go to places that are heated and cause a lot of problems for people. And if you've read in the paper, these guys have been on the news because they will form large colonies in people's homes and in buildings and they're spreading their range out as things get warmer so they're definitely becoming more of a problem now we're going to move on to the tree bats these bats are almost never found in caves the, on the left is the red bat it's probably the most common eastern tree bat and the right is the seminal bat it's more restricted to the coastal plain area these bats are out on the landscape roosting by themselves they're solitary so they never form colonies and they might just be a mother and her young or just by herself or a male. And they kind of hide and try to look like a dead leaf. So when you see bats that seem to come out of nowhere, that's probably tree bats that are just hanging out in your neighborhood. And these bats, we didn't really know what they did in the winter time. They do migrate. Uh, most of the tree bats are migratory to some degree. And they will, the, the red bats that live in the north will come down south. And actually we figured out while we were prescribed burning, we would see bats flying out from under the leaf litter and realize that those were red bats. And they will go under leaf and pine needle litter to just get a layer of insulation during cold snaps. And they, and they just need to not freeze. They're very much, these tree bats have a lot more fur. They have fur on their tail, thicker fur, a lot of fur on their head, really thick necks so that they can stay warm because they never hibernate. They'll go into a torpor in cold periods, but they won't truly hibernate. Here's some more bats that use cavities as well as um, just hanging out singly in trees. The northern yellow bat is a species that we're studying a little bit more. It's more coastal plain exclusive and it uses Spanish moss clumps to roost in. And we don't know a lot about this species, but we've got a graduate student working on a project on the coast and we're learning a lot more. This is our largest bat, the hoary bat. This bat has a 16 inch wingspan. They tend to fly high above large bodies of water. They're, they're pretty much the toughest bat that we have and they're across North America. And this species migrates long distances and they can definitely stay active very often. So they can be out when it's pretty cold. They have very thick fur. And our biggest eared bat is the Raffinus figured bat. This species is considered rare. It ha kind of has two different habitat types. It lives in the coastal plain of Georgia in bottomland hardwood forest in a hollow big tupelo and cypress trees. If you guys know anything about that habitat, it's not very common anymore. 
The best place for that, this species in Georgia is along the Altamaha River floodplain. We have preserved some areas there with huge hollow trees. And these guys need pretty big hollow trees. They'll raise their young in hollow trees and they will be out on the landscape. They'll use trees all year round and just kind of switch to different tree types in the winter. They also live in the northern part of their ranges in the north part of Georgia. They, they're really kind of non-existent in the Piedmont and there they'll be in caves and mines both in the summer and in the winter time. So I want to talk a little bit about why bats are beneficial. It used to be that everybody thought bats were pests and there wasn't really any good and they needed to be killed like a lot of other things that were considered a nuisance. But we know that bats eat a lot of insects. One bat can eat half to their entire body weight in insects in a night, which is incredible. If you think about you eating what you weigh and then trying to fly around, and a lot of them are pregnant when they're doing this, it's really unbelievable. And a thousand bats in a colony, like little brown bats, which sounds like a lot, but body size is not that much, can eat 22 pounds of insects in a night. That's an incredible amount of insects. And they can help control a crop pest. This is an example of an ear of corn that was eaten by a corn earworm moth. And the bats love the moth, and they will eat them in large numbers, especially the free-tailed bats out in Texas. So without bats, they would be a huge problem for agriculture. And there was a recent study that was completed that kind of went over the economic importance of bats in, in light of all the things that are impacting them. And they estimated that if bats were lost, it would cost the agriculture more than $3.7 billion a year in pest control. So that's a huge issue if bats are lost. And there is the paper that was printed in Science is also over there talking about the economic importance of bats if you guys are interested. Another issue is biological control. I hadn't really heard this very much, but we have a farmer in Quitman, Georgia, in South Georgia that had a pecan farm and wanted to go organic and decided to try to put up some bat houses and see if he could get bats to eat his insects. And he put up one and it immediately got filled with three-tailed bats. And so he just kept putting them up and he was able to go completely organic using the bats. At some point he used the guano as fertilizer for the trees. And those bats, uh, the Tifton campus of UGA has been doing some studies to look at where they're foraging and what impact they're having on the surrounding landowners. And they're having a big impact on insect control, not just on him, his farm, but all around. So this is a good thing to promote as, when we're talking about how we can use these species to our benefit, providing them with a roost and then getting a great benefit of pest control is amazing. Other than insect eating, bats do a lot of things around the world and a big thing is pollination. And all of these products we wouldn't have without bats. And there's many more. There's a huge long list of things bats pollinate and are important, a very critical part of the life cycle of many plants. And we tend to forget this. We always think about <coughs> bees as pollinators. So we know bees are having problems too. Bats are important pollinators and they're having problems. So if you see these trends, you're seeing that a lot of these things that are very important economically to us are in danger because we're losing these species that are required in the life cycle of these plants. Other things we get from bats, most of the people think of guano as a bad thing. Nobody wants it in their house, but a lot of people harvest it and it can go for quite a high price on the internet. If you have a contained bat colony that's in a good place, you can harvest the guano and sell it or use it on your own garden. It makes great <laughs> fertilizer. It's just, it's just insect parts, so it's a really good fertilizer that people have been using forever. So that's one thing that can be beneficial even though you don't want it in large quantities in your house. Bats are also important as food sources for other animals. This is not in a U.S. species, this is vampire bats, but that we see this all the time in Georgia, especially rat snakes will stick their tail in a crack in a cave entrance and grab bats flying out of the cave and eat them. Raccoons, owls, hawks, many things eat bats, so they're important that way. And this is a situation, if, has anybody ever been to the Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin? Good, a couple of people. So in Austin, Texas, they built this bridge right in downtown, and right after they built it, pre-tailed bats moved in, in in crazy amounts. It was just an incredible number of bats, and the city was freaking out because all of a sudden they had all these bats in downtown Austin. Luckily, Bat Conservation International <coughs> had their home in Austin and kind of was like, wait, slow down, why is this really a bad thing? I mean, the bridge is built for bats, they're not doing anything but roosting there. So they, the city started to see if they could, you know, 
not really do anything about it what would happen and it became a huge attraction almost everyone that goes to austin visits the bridge you can go buy bat souvenirs on the bridge you can take a bat cruise and people will be out it's amazing the numbers of people that are out at night to watch the bats coming out because it's one of the most urban places you can see this many bats at one time so they the city really turned it around and, and it's become a very popular tourist attraction so that's a way bats can be beneficial as well so I have to make a scary gravy slide because everybody associates bats with rabies and for some reason bats are just, everybody thinks that all bats have rabies and that it's really scary and you have to be careful. Well you do have to be careful, bats are a rabies vector species just like any other rabies vector species but the prevalence of rabies in bats is not higher than other species. In fact it's lower than some other species and you're much more likely to get rabies from a dog than you are from a bat. In general, the reason why this myth kind of comes up is when people come in contact with bats, they're usually not doing well. They may not be rabid, but if you find a bat laying on the ground, it's not natural, so you need to really be careful. And it's basically educating people never pick up a bat. If you have a bat in your house, there's a lot of instructions on the internet about how to get it out. Open windows, throw a sheet over it, whatever you have to do. But you know, you don't want to handle this species, but it is a myth that, that bats have a really high prevalence of rabies. That's not true. Now bats are problematic. Not everything about them is good, and I've mentioned this. They will get in your house, and nobody really wants to see bats flying around your living room. Even me would probably be like, oh, that's not so good, I don't know where they're coming from. <laughs> but but uh, these are free-tailed bats. You can see their tails even in this kind of blurry, far away picture. And this is the most common species causing problems in Georgia. These pictures are from coastal Florida, actually, but we have the same issue. These tiles on the roof, are where the bats love to cram up underneath and get a lot of heat so they put on these really fancy houses with tiles and they just got tons of bats mm -hmm. so they're there everybody freaks out it, you, you probably would freak out if you had this many bats that's definitely a problem but you don't necessarily have to call someone and pay thousands of dollars to get the problem taken care of i always tell people when they call you know first settle down and tell me how many bats you have and a lot of times it's like i think there's five you know it's like, okay, you'll be fine everybody's going to be okay but if you have hundreds of bats you might need help but you need to look at the problem mainly you want to identify how they're getting in where they're getting in and and you can usually see that if you go out at night and see where they're flying out from that's the first thing and you can often see staining where they're coming in and out and then this is the really simple exclusion you put window screening with duct tape on the top and sides over where they're coming in when the bats go out they crawl out that screening and then when they're trying to get back in they'll land on it and can't get back in now they'll look for other places to get in so this might be where you discover that you have multiple entry points so you have to be patient and do it over time but it's really something that most homeowners can do on their own and then once the bats are all out you check and make sure they're gone you can seal up the holes where they're getting in Hopefully not using spray foam. I have gone to pick up bats with spray foam covering them because people put it in there and the bats try to get in while it's not dry and then it doesn't do anybody any good. Yeah, so that's not the best solution, although a lot of people do it. Um, but the big thing to consider is that you don't want to exclude bats during the maternity season, which we say is between May 1st and August 15th. That's a big window, but it's pretty helpful in this part of the world because they could have young that can't fly and those young will be trapped in the roost and the mothers won't be able to get back and they'll die and nobody wants that to happen for a lot of reasons. And if people ask you, all bats in Georgia are protected. You cannot intentionally harm bats. And so that's a, that's a good thing that bats have going for them. There are a lot of other species that we have that are kind of the unlucky species that have no protection, but bats actually do. So they're Bat Conservation International, I mention them all the time because they're the main conservation group for bats. They have a ton of information on their website about bat exclusions and how to deal with bats in your home and I always point people there when they have questions. A lot of people also ask me, the good thing is, people say, I have bats in my house and I don't want them in my house, but I want to give them a house. How do I do it? You can put up a bat house and it can be the most beautiful, perfect bat house in the best location and you won't get bats, but you can try your best to make the house the right type of house and put it in the right place so you have a better chance of getting bats. There are many types of houses. Most people don't need a bat condo, but if you have a real problem, you might want to put one up if you have thousands and thousands of bats. But most of them are these smaller multi-chamber. This is a pretty large maternity box that can hold a lot of bats. You would normally start with a one or two chambered small box and try to put it up in, in a good situation. The first thing is that it needs to be the right design. I also have sheets over there for an example of how to build a single chamber bat box. 
so that you can just start out and see if you get bats. Build a small one first. If you get some, build a bigger one. You need to put it in the right area. A lot of people put them on trees with leaves. So the trees leaf out and then the box is shaded and the bats won't use it. They want hot. And you think that it's hot in Georgia. You don't want to have a, a box in the sun, but they do. They want it to be really hot. That's why they're in your attic. And we usually paint them gray in this part of the world. In Florida, they're often painted white, but in the Northeast, they paint them black so they can get as hot as possible. You want them to be near good habitat. You don't have to have great habitat everywhere. Obviously, if you already have bats, there's habitat nearby, but it's good if they're near water and some trees and other things that come to bats. And we try to get them at least 20 feet off the ground. The best placement is putting them on a pole, kind of out in the open where they get a lot of sun. This looks shaded, but it's actually very sunny where this guy has the boxes in his pecan orchard. And they have a lot of choices for boxes so they can switch around during different parts of the year. But follow the design protocols and put them in the best place and hopefully you'll get bats. And it's best to put them up in the winter time, give them a little time to season and then see if you'll get bats. And you can have an empty box for years and then one day they'll show up. So you never know. Bats in decline. This is one thing I want to talk about. We consider most of our bats in Georgia to be declining. This is probably the only species that's not the free-tailed bat because they are expanding their range, but probably every other species is in some amount of decline. Bats like really nice old growth habitat in a lot of places. They like trees that are dying with bark falling off. They like clean caves. They need clean water and healthy forests. And we've changed our landscape a lot. We've lost a lot of habitat. We've modified it. Bats have houses now instead of trees to deal with. They have water that's silted over that doesn't have the insect mast coming off. And they have caves that have a lot of disturbance and a lot of trash and, and very big issues that have caused them to abandon them. So in general, they're dying because of all the things that other wildlife are dying because of loss of habitat and changes that we've made. And then there were some new things that came onto the landscape. This is a wind farm, which if you guys have been to the Midwest or the Northeast, it's, there are a lot of wind farms. And there are some in the plains areas that are just vast, and then there are a lot of across mountaintops. And it really was, we figured that these would be a bigger problem for birds when they first went up. But one really foggy night in, in West Virginia, hundreds of bats were found dead under one particular wind farm on the night where you know visibility was poor and then people started looking a little closer and they were finding them everywhere. I don't have current numbers for the numbers that have that they suspect have died, but it's significant and we imagine that it's impacting tree bats at a similar level to, to other issues with the cave bats. And it there are a lot of studies going on to try to figure out why it doesn't appear that there are any kind of noises that attract the bats to these turbines but they do seem to be attracted to the actual blades and they'll hit the blades and die that way. And they also will die from kind of a change in barometric pressure right near those turbines. And they are mostly impacted when it's low wind nights, when it's good for bats to fly and it's foggy conditions. Those are also the nights where you're not getting very much energy from these turbines. So if you turn off the turbines in low wind events, then the mortality decreases pretty much to zero and you know the bats are able to fly through. On high wind nights when these are the most productive, you're not going to get bats and birds migrating nearly as much. But that still costs the energy companies a lot of money, so it's a really hard battle to try to figure out what to do. They're also working on new designs, but everything that's implemented has to be on a level you can easily do. And you can put a boom box with death metal music playing on these and it will keep bats away, but it's not realistic to be able to mount them on all of the turbines <laughs> and keep up maintenance because just crawling one of these towers is a significant effort. So there are many things to consider and there's a lot of work happening. And we thought that was the worst thing until white nose syndrome came along. How many of you guys have heard of white nose syndrome? So at least half, that's good. This was discovered in 2006 when bats were reported flying outside of caves in the wintertime in New York. And some biologists went to check it out and they found these bats with white fuzzy noses. A lot of work was done and it was discovered that those bats were dying of starvation. The fungus grows on the muzzles of the bats and on the wing membranes and irritates their skin. So the bats wake up from hibernation. They regularly wake up throughout hibernation. They have a pretty regular pattern of waking up when they're in caves. 
But if you wake up one or two, many one or two extra times, it can kill a bat because they only have so much fat reserves to get them through the winter. And in the Northeast, when they fly out of caves and there's snow, there's no insects for them to eat and they die. And that's what was happening. White nose syndrome has spread more quickly than we could have ever imagined. This little red circle is where it started in New York. And this is the map that just came out yesterday because a new record in Missouri was found yesterday. And we've got some new records in Kentucky. You can see here's Georgia. We have one right there in Tennessee and one right there in Alabama. It's surely in Georgia. We just didn't find it last winter. And we're going to be spending the next couple of months looking for it this winter. We, all of the species listed here are, are ones affected by white nose syndrome, and we have all of those species except for the cave myotis. And at this point, it's estimated that 5.7 to 6.7 million bats have died from white nose syndrome. That number is going to continue to go up because the largest hibernacula for Indiana bats, the endangered species, is in this part of their range, and white nose syndrome is just now getting there. So the numbers are just going to keep growing up. It causes mass mortality. Bats fly out of the caves trying to find food and they either just die in the snow or they'll cling to trees and fall off or they die in caves in mass numbers and these caves are empty of bats and filled with skeletons at this point. The fungus is Geomyces destructans, which is a new fungus to science. It was the, the genus is very common in caves, but destructans was newly discovered. We know that bats spread it from one to the other, and that's the main way that it's spread. But we also know it can be spread on gear. If you have spores on gear and you take it into another cave, you can move it. We don't have any evidence, really hard evidence, that anyone has moved it in the United States. But we do have some pretty big jumps to sites that have a lot of people and not a lot of bats in them, which makes us think it's possible, but we cannot make any, you know, you can't prove that it happens. We do know now that it came from Europe, likely on caving gear to the cave where it was first found. And the species has been identified in Europe. It's the same species. It's the same strain. It didn't mutate over here. We're not sure if it's native to Europe or if it went through European bat populations a long time ago. And now those bats are the ones that are immune. But over 90% of bats die in caves. In a lot of caves, it's 98, 99%. And it is, there are a few species that are surviving and we do have evidence of reproduction but there's going to be a huge drop in numbers and we're not sure if all of the species will make it through. The biggest thing that we can do is decontaminate. If you're going into caves, wear clothes that have never been in a cave if you just go in one once. If you're going into multiple caves, you need to decontaminate your gear between caves because not just this fungus, but there are so many things unique to cave environments that we've probably been spreading around forever. And this could be the first of many things like this that could happen. We have a, a white nose response plan, a lots of information on our website if you want to check it out. I have a brochure over there with some more information and there's a lot on the web. And the main thing is to educate people about what's happening with white nose syndrome. If you hear a caver talking, make sure you ask them if they're aware of this and they're decontaminating. And just educate people about why bats are important and that we should care. So what are we doing in Georgia? Just quickly kind of want to go, go over. I'd love to go into all our conservation projects, but I don't have that kind of time. We do a lot of surveys. We put up big nets to catch bats in areas where we think they're going to fly. They're tricky and smart. They aren't blind. They see very well. And they avoid our nets at all costs. So they're very hard to catch. But we do our best to catch them and do inventories of them. We do a bat blitz every year somewhere in the southeastern United States. This year it's going to be in Oklahoma, which is a bit of a stretch for the southeast, but they needed a bat blitz. We had one here in Georgia where we get a lot of researchers together to do several nights of surveys and get as much information as possible. And sometimes we get extra people to come along. We had a photographer from Oregon come and take some awesome pictures of some of our bats, so that was really beneficial. I also have an Anabat route project. This is an old picture. We don't have a, a little Tupperware container on top of the vehicle anymore, but we have a microphone mounted on top of a vehicle where we drive and record the echolocation calls of bats. I have routes all across the state, and we're collecting that data and trying to do some analysis. It's not as easy as you put it in the computer and it spits out a list of bats. It is doing that right now, but it's incorrect. So there's a lot of people working on it to try to figure out how we can quickly get information this is critical in places like New York where you can't catch bats anymore because most of them are dead. So the only real way to get any information is to use acoustic work. But I have volunteers running routes and look for press releases if you guys aren't on the DNR listservs. We do a lot of press releases about volunteer projects and things if you want to get involved. 
I will be filling some routes that people didn't take. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot around Atlanta because you can't drive a vehicle very slowly around Atlanta, which is what you have to do, and straight, which just doesn't really work here. But I'm trying to add more routes as I get more time. We also do a lot of assessment and monitoring on these caves where we have colonies that come every year. We try to count them and see how those numbers are changing. We do monitoring in the winter for white nose syndrome. Like I said, we're just about to start that. And we do swab bats and, and send in uh, information for some of these nationwide studies on white nose syndrome. So we try to do as much as we can to participate in that. We also take occasionally take great measures to protect caves. This is a, the only maternity colony for gray bats we have in Georgia, and it was being really impacted by partiers. It's not really a good caving cave. Cavers don't go there, but people were lighting fires in the entrance and the smoke was going right into the maternity colony. They still pretty much abandoned it, even with the gate, because there's been so much of a history of disturbance, and we did have some um, people break into this gate, which is not common, but they're very determined when they do that. They have to haul equipment in to weld things. It's unbelievable. Wow. But, but we fixed it, so hopefully that this is kind of a secondary site right now for the bats, but at least it's protected. And we do a lot of other things. I have many other projects going on, like I mentioned, the Yellow Bat Project and other things like that. But the main thing is that we don't see a lot of things like this anymore. We don't have a lot of large colony roosting bats. We have records of these in Georgia, but they're pretty much gone. We're on the southern end of a lot of these ranges, which could be really important with white nose syndrome because our bats might be able to survive better than bats in the frozen north because they don't have to hibernate as long. And if you guys know anything about our winters lately, we have insects pretty much all year round. So if bats, and you will see bats on the landscape. And last year, big brown bats didn't really hibernate because they didn't have to. I have reports of them active all winter. And so we think that these species that are the big colony roosters that are major impacted, majorly impacted by white nose syndrome might be able to survive in the southern portion of the range. But we really need to make our conditions good for them and figure out where they are using, what areas they're using, and what they really need and protect bats like this. And like Tara mentioned, we are always looking for donations because we do not get any state funding for the non-game wildlife program. We're not part of the tax funded programs. Uh, there used to be just a couple of people working with non-game in Georgia. We get all our money from the sale of the Hummingbird and Bald Eagle license plate. We used to get most of that money. They changed that last year. Now we get a small portion of it, which is unfortunate, and it costs you a lot more. If you don't want to pay the, what is it, $60, Thomas? Yeah. Yeah. To get your license plate, you can just go dr directly donate online and get a regular license plate and make up the difference. That way we'll get a lot more money. We don't mind that. We're trying to get the license plate thing changed again, but it's not easy. We also have a tax check off every year, if you notice that, and we do multiple mm -hmm. fundraisers for wildlife, and we work a lot on grants. That's mostly what we're funded. So we're kind of funded year <laughs> by year, and we, we find our own funding. And a lot of people don't realize that, so we always want to bring it up. But if you guys have any questions, I'll take any now. And that is not a Georgia bat, that's a sucker footed bat from Madagascar, but it's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> On the bats that hit the, the big fan, the big wind farm, mm -hmm. right? Well, how come they can't echo echo locate those blades? They're not fast moving blades. They're they are a lot faster than you think. The oh, tip God. of the blade actually moves at a very fast speed, and it looks so slow to us. But that it also tricks the bats because they are echo locating. But for some reason, it's like they're tracking it like it's an insect, and they're not really sure what it is. You know, it's dark, and things are, and and there's just a lot of work going on as to why that would be. We never expected, but I've seen videos thermal images of bats coming up and obviously following the blade and the other one comes behind them so fast they don't even see it and it hits them and kills them. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, we didn't really expect it to be that bad, but it's a major impact. Mm -hmm. That uh, big ear bat that you showed, is that a solitary bat or do they form? They do form colonies. Mm -hmm. We will find a lot of individual males in trees. The males always get kicked out. The females seem to want to be by themselves when they're raising their young. But the females will form colonies to raise their young in those hollow trees. And that is a cool thing. If you are ever in a swamp and you see a big tree that has a gap in the bottom and you're not too scared, I mean, it's, there's some stuff in there, but look around <laughs> and look up. And if you have any kind of light and shine up, you will see these bats. And they, they usually kind of fold their ears up when they're sleeping. And they will all, if you see a colony, they'll all open their ears and you know immediately what they are. And it's so cool. But the females will switch around. <laughs> it is really cool. <laughs> the females will switch around roosts a lot because they do have that a large amount of bats with 
you know, the smell, it'll attract more predators and things, so they kind of have to move those colonies. But it's sort of a safety and numbers thing, a bit of a trade-off. The males tend to be more, they'll stay at roost longer because it's just one or two of them. Anybody have any more questions? Yeah? You said that the white nose syndrome kills 99% of bats in the colonies it affects. Is that because it just the 1% doesn't ever get it or they survive? That's a good question. And there's still some research trying to figure out if the bats from one year to the other are bats that are naive bats that are coming into that cave from another cave and haven't been exposed the year before, or if there actually is some resistance. And we think at this point we're seeing some resistance, but bats are long lived. They can live 20 plus years in the wild. So we won't know for a while if they're being successful at reproducing there, there are places where they're trying to go and document new bats every year, but it's a trade-off because these bats are already fighting a fungus and you don't want to disturb them too much. So it's very difficult. Any kind of bat research has a certain level of disturbance. And when you have such low numbers, you don't want to disturb them. You don't know if the effect is just from the fungus or from how many times people are in those caves. But it's, we're hoping there's some resistance and that's what we're seeing. We have evidence that females that have had white nose syndrome have survived and reproduced in the summer, but we don't know if they, those young have been successful and lived through the next season to also reproduce. And they're trying to figure that out. Hopefully in the next couple of years we'll get some more data on those. As they're doing some banding projects, but bat banding is also difficult because bats don't have ankles like birds. So you have to band them on the wrist and the band has to touch each wing membrane. And it's a very tricky band. It's, it has a little flare so it doesn't dig into the wing, but you don't want it to slip over the wrist or over the elbow, then the bat can't fly. So it, it's a difficult thing to do. And some, it's very controversial as to whether, how many bats it actually has a negative impact on. But that's really the only way to track them. You can't put anything else on them that lasts for a long time. Um, are, is the fungus persistent in the environment? Do you have a problem with it recurring in the yes. vernacular? Yeah, if you, if you go into a site that's had white nose syndrome at any time, or even one where you haven't detected it on the bats and test the soil and the cave walls, you can pull a fungus off and grow it in the lab. Mm -hmm. So it seems to stay in those caves even after all the bats are dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have they come up with uh, any treatments? There, there's a lot of research and they the newest the most recent one we have a symposium every year for all the state biologists and researchers working on this where we learn about everything that's happened in the last year the one last June was it was beneficial but there wasn't a lot of great news that any of the trials for anything that would prevent the fungus from growing has worked there's a new trial that seems to be working right now where they're injecting kind of a little almost like a pit tag with fungicide in it in bats to help them survive mm -hmm. and it seems to be working but it can't be implemented on any large scale so mm -hmm. something like that would be something you would do in certain sites to a specific number of bats to try to keep a part of that population alive but there's really no way to protect those bats in a large number with that kind of a handling having to put these implants into bats. And there are a lot of other things that have been tried spraying fungicide on bats as they're entering or exiting caves. The problem is there's a lot of different fungal spores in caves. There's a lot of fungus that's native and very important. And it'll, the whole cave system can break down if you start spraying fungicide in places. So it's not really something you can implement on a large scale. Just to protect the bats, you would probably do more harm than you would good. And then the fungus, as you guys know, if we get fungus, it's really hard to get rid of. It's one of the worst things to fight like that, so it's not going to be easy. But there is a lot of research going on, so hopefully we'll find some answers that might be helpful. And there is rehabilitation guides for rehabilitating bats with white nose syndrome. They've, they've gone through a couple different versions of that. So there are people, if you bring a bat in and warm it up, it will groom off of the fungus and it will survive. Mm -hmm. So if they can get through hibernation, they can, and their skin will grow back as if it's not too far gone, mm -hmm. it will grow, they'll close the holes in their wings. They, they can fly with portions of their wings missing. So they will survive if you can bring them in, but it's not, again, not a long-term solution. But if you get bats with white nose syndrome, they can be rehabilitated. There have been people trying things like putting warming units in caves to protect bats, but that hasn't worked so far either. But if you warm them up, you have to feed them. So that's the big thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then the fungus, they can get again because they... Right, they get it again every year. So they're not building a resistance if... They may, the, the bats in Europe, 
get the fungus, but they don't die. So they'll have, they not at the scale that we have here, but you'll have some bats with white noses and they'll, they'll live. Mm -hmm. And so it seems that that doesn't irritate them enough to wake them up or they have some amount of resistance. It doesn't actually destroy their cell membranes like it does here. So that may be what's happening to some of these bats. But if a bat survives one winter of white nose syndrome, goes back to that cave, they're gonna pick it up again. Whether or not they can survive it year after year, they have to have some kind of resistance that they're going to. So do they think that that's how the bats in Europe have begun, like are surviving as they build up a resistance or? It's still sort of unknown. If it's, a, if it's a native species in Europe, then they just naturally, it's not something that impacts them. There's, fungus will grow all over the place. So sometimes it's just growing and it doesn't do any harm and other times it is very harmful. So if the bats have always had to deal with that fungus in Europe, then they, you know, they have a natural resistance to it. But if it's possible that long ago this was introduced into Europe and went through their bat population, they don't have huge numbers of bats like we have in the United States. So they may have at one time and lost their bats, but we don't have any record of a large die off. So we don't know if that happened or not. People are still sort of investigating that. And in Europe, bats are much more protected than in the United States. A lot of the caves have very specific, you can't go in if there are bats. People may not have been doing surveys for a long time. Most of their survey work was acoustic. They were way ahead of us on acoustic work because they were their laws were very strict that even researchers couldn't easily get a permit to do bat work because they, they had low numbers and they were all very heavily protected. So there's not as much information about you know, historically how their bats have been doing. But they do have a lot of acoustic work and they've been doing a lot of bat work in here. Mm -hmm. Can you chip them? Like a pit tagging? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a lot of studies do that and, and chip bats, but it is, again, the you've seen the tags are relatively big right. for those little bats. There's There have been some studies and I'm not sure what all the results were about mortality. And again, if bats don't come back to the cave, we don't really know if they just didn't come back to that cave or if they died. And what is the natural mortality for that group? We're not really sure. So you can pit tag bats. The trouble is there's always multiple entrances to a cave. Some of them are too big. You know, the rings that you scan the pit tags with are not, you can't make a huge ring and get all of the bats that are going through. So it's, you can, hand scan bats if you pit tag them and try to find them and there are studies, but it's expensive and it's hard to implement on a large scale, it requires catching every <coughs> bat. So when, you, when you're doing a long-term study at a site, you can pit tag every individual and there are places where that's been done. But again, you're risking a lot of disturbance to that population and when you've already got a really low population, there's a big argument as to whether you should pit tag them and potentially cause more harm. 